Where did it start for you, Steve? You were young, playing, and you were actively involved at an early age. How did it all start for you in the beginning days? Well, um, being a New Yorker, I was very fortunate. Yeah. You know, there was so much music in New York. And uh, the Board of Education at that time was very supportive of, of kids learning how to play uh, music. Interesting. And uh, that's one of the things uh, that this country is grappling with now. Mm -hmm. As you cut funding to the arts, um, you... Uh, undermine the full development of students the student point, and, point. and the human uh, a, a ability to understand the, the full picture. Great. So then you either had to come home with a clarinet or a violin. Mm. Uh, that, it was mandatory. In the early days, yeah. You, yeah, when you, it was when mandatory. You were young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, people don't know, like, uh, for instance, when I started reading music, I was never a very good math student. My mother was always pulling out her hair. Mm -hmm. And then I started reading music, and my math scores got better. Right. You know, it's that type of thing. It helps fully develop, uh, you know, and, and it gets your intuition together, your thinking outside the box, all right. this, right. All, everything that uh, supports the arts, uh, supports the ability for children to grow. Right. So being in New York, like I said, uh, that was part of the thing. I became a, a percussionist, and uh, that's basically how it started. I, um, uh, there was always music in the house. My mother sang uh, classical music at one point in her life, and um, my dad was a huge jazz fan, and he was a big Clifford Brown fan, oh. a great <laughs> yeah, trumpeter. Great, yeah. And when Clifford Brown uh, uh, tragically died in a car accident, um, he uh, turned his allegiance to Miles Davis. So I had Miles Davis playing all the time. My dad was always playing Miles. and um, So you're hearing jazz around the house. I'm hearing jazz, you're but we also, my, my, uh, you know, my parents were very supportive. There was always music. So I would ask for a record. And they would buy me a record. Nice. And uh, soon I had a record collection, and soon I had a little portable record player, and I became a little DJ. And <laughs> I still have the the the, the carrying case. Oh, when really? I have my and I, all my forty fives. I had a huge collection of forty fives. <laughs> I started making my own charts. <laughs> I you know all kinds of stuff. It was crazy, but I loved recorded music. The first album I owned uh, was uh, Henry Mancini's Peter Gunn, because I loved that show yeah, and I loved great. that theme. Yeah. And some of my favorite first records uh, were The Coasters, Yakety Yak, Charlie Brown, and, you know, and then of course The Contours, Do You Love Me. Those records I loved. So I was a big Motown stack yeah. person and then yeah. obviously crazy about James Brown. So we were listening to stuff and then of course it all kind of led to me being a Beatles fanatic. When the Beatles uh, appeared on Ed Sullivan, it really changed February my 64, life. February of right? I don't, I don't. Uh, and, um, you know, from that moment on, I, I was uh, a Beatle nut. So I'm listening to Miles Davis in one ear and the Beatles in the other ear. <laughs> so that's, that leads to my musical schizophrenia. Uh, and I'm, was drum set a part of this at all at that point? Yeah, well, I was, I was, from that point on, I was drawing Ringo in class, yeah. you know, on, <laughs> behind the drum kit, you know, I mean, you know. Um, but I didn't have a full kit. Um, my grandmother bought me a snare drum for my, I think, my eighth birthday. It was like, I, that's when I started studying formally. Hmm. As, um, they wouldn't just get me to do it. was like, okay, are you going to practice? If you're going to practice and study, then we will get you a drum. And the concept was for me to get a kit, you know, a piece by piece. So mm. if I started to progress, then they would get me another piece. Well, what a great carrot. A carrot of the right. stick, man. How Absolutely. great was that? That's brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you know, my dad's an architect. My mother's in the Board of Education. You know, very very wise people right. and um, hardworking, and, but very supportive. And so, the, so that's how, it, and, and so very uh, nurturing environment musically. And 
like I said, being spoiled in New York, yeah, yeah. all this great music yeah, around, right. and all the, the very high level of musicianship. You know, everybody was good. Absolutely. I yeah, mean, yeah. the schools I came out with, I wasn't, I was like way down there. I mean, I know people who were like amazing yeah. at a very early age. <laughs> I mean, just incredible. People that you aspire to. <laughs> yeah. Heroic people in the school, you know? <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I, um, you know, so that was the environment. That was the environment. So when did professionalism, where you started getting involved with being paid to play music, where had that start? Well, there were some after-school programs mm. that were very good. Um, I had a really good music teacher in uh, intermediate school, which is like junior high school, yeah, but it yeah. was a new version of junior high school, right. where you had the sixth grade into uh, the eighth grade. Yeah. And when I graduated from elementary school, in my sixth grade, I, I got into the music class. I wasn't even in, in a music class through one through five. In elementary school. In right, elementary right, school. Right. Then in the sixth grade, I got into the music class. Okay. And that led to me going to this other school, this intermediate school, 144, and I had a teacher named uh, uh, Mr. Brown. He was, a, he was the music teacher. And at that time, you could audition in New York. Here again, the great environment. You had borough-wide orchestras and city-wide orchestras. Right, right. So every borough had an orchestra and a band, not just uh, one or the. You had both because the band was, you know, just brass with no strings, and the orchestra yeah. had strings, right, brass, right, the whole right. thing. So a concert band and an orchestra yeah, band. Yeah, exactly, right, right, exactly. Right. And I got into uh, the Bronx borough-wide. Orchestra, and we performed at Carnegie Hall. Huge. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So I'm like, huge. It's incredible. So you're like 11, 12 years old. You're playing Carnegie Hall. I mean, it's uh, it's unbelievable, you know. And it's something that you never forget, Absolutely. you know. And it really drives you. So, you know, that happens. My teacher is very supportive. That led to me auditioning to go to Music and Art High School, which is Fiorello H. LaGuardia oh. High School of Music and Art in New York, which is, which for performing arts is the annex Absolutely. to that school. So that's- that, Very well that known movie, too, by the way, yeah. Yeah, yeah that yeah, yeah. movie Fame, which is yeah. about performing arts, right. well, that, that's the, our annex, right, okay? Right, right, Music and Art is the school that, you know, you had to audition to get in. Wow. So many greats. From Richard T. to, I mean, you name it. I mean, yeah. uh, everybody. Came that's out of that a, you school, know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Matt yeah. Adderley Jr. When yeah. I was going to school, I was already in the school when Marcus Miller and Omar Akeem came after. But I was like, <laughs> you know, Buddy Williams was there. Yeah. Uh, Clifton Anderson. I mean, there's so many great. Yeah, Noel Pointer, yeah. Paul Cabarro, uh, Angie Bofield, wow. uh, Dave Valentine. I mean, the, the, I mean, the list goes on, and I'm leaving out a tremendous amount of right, right, people right. and yeah. legendary people, like yeah. legends, yeah, yeah. way before yeah. I went to that school. Yeah, but that yeah. was the environment wow. uh, of that school. Now, how I got into that school was there was this thing where you would, uh, you would practice your audition piece, right, to get into to audition for the school. Right. We would... You know, everybody would work on like the most difficult piece of music possible. Yeah. You know, it was like uh, what what Frank Zappa would call the black page. There was so much right. ink. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> you right. know right. What I mean? And I was I came up with you know I picked a few pieces and I I practiced up and everything, but I started to think to myself I, I was like well you know a person can audition on this piece of music and read it perfectly that doesn't mean that they can. You know, they, maybe they just do that for this one piece. Absolutely. That doesn't give the span of their ability or right. talent. That and I thought that, that that was a flawed wow. uh, concept. Wow. So when <laughs> I went into my audition, they said, well, where's your piece of music? I said, well, I didn't bring one because I don't think... I said, give me something to read. 
because I think that this is a flawed uh, you told me approach. That. What guts? <laughs> yeah. So they gave me this piece of music. They were like, what? You know? And so they gave me this piece of music. Now, I had been studying some of the most difficult pieces of music that you could possibly play on concert snare drum. Yeah. I mean, just really hard stuff. And so when they, they were like, whoa. And so they scramble around. They give me this piece of music. It's so freaking easy. I couldn't believe it. I just could not believe it. So I read the thing down, one great. thing like that. They're like, whoa, okay. And I got it. <laughs> That's how I got into music and art. And, uh, but I, um, I learned about politics very early on in that school because it was extremely political. Yeah, yeah. And I, after the first uh, semester, I realized that I had to think outside the box once again and kind of go underground. And I had a great teacher who's now the dean of music at Manhattan School of Music, uh, Justin DeTrocho. Okay, great. He was the uh, percussion instructor uh, at, at the time. And he believed in me. Uh, so um, we, uh, he kind of took me under his wing and he let me do my thing. Wow. Uh, and I would just operate outside the school uh, parameters, really. Um, you know, I, I, I made some great friends there. Uh, the great Kenny Washington, the yeah, drummer. Yeah, great player. We were there at the same time. Kenny, it was very funny. Kenny was like an old man when he was in junior, in high school. He was walking around like he was Art Blakey at that time. You an know, old like, soul, yeah. Old yeah, soul. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just a lot of great players. A lot of great players and a great environment. But here again, I had to figure out how I was going to operate under these very uh, restricted... Yeah conditions yeah yeah I they weren't it wasn't free thinking enough yeah yeah so I started to just work on my stuff outside of school of my my closest friend Leroy Cloudon who didn't go to music and art um, but he was a, he's a great drummer and he was a, a, a person we would play together a lot and he was kind of we pushed each other you know, he's a fantastic instructor these days at uh, Drummer's Collective in New York City. Wow. And we just, we pushed one another, you know, uh, uh, to get to the next level. You know, he would challenge one another. Okay, yeah. can you do this? Can you do that? And yeah, we, yeah. And uh, it was that kind of thing. Um, and and uh, so that's the kind of environment that you had. And then, you know, um, while I was at Music and Art, there were two uh, programs going on. There was Jazzmobile and Jazz Interactions. Well, those were great programs. Uh, jazz Interactions was kind of these great jazz musicians' ver uh, answer to Jazzmobile. Because Jazzmobile, uh, that Billy Taylor started, right. had its own thing. It was funded. They got some government funding. And they had their own curriculum. And right. it was a certain way. But some of the cats, the other cats, were like, well, maybe they should know... Maybe the curriculum should be a little different. So right. the great Joe Newman, Frank Foster, wow. Charlie Persib, uh, uh, Freddie Waits, wow. Ben Riley, great uh, uh, I believe uh, uh, Sir Roland Hanna. Oh, but was, what an incredible core of energy of great artists right. who were also educators in their way and what they did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. that's the here again, and then. I met, then, then Daoud, Freddie Waits, kind of took me under his wing. And his best friend was Jabali Billy Hart. So I had two of the greatest drummers of all time, jazz, wow. and they would take me around. And I was their little project, and, they, and I was their little mascot, and they would take around. So they would take me to clubs uh, before I was at, you know, legally wow. able to go in. Yeah, and, yeah. and I would sit and... and and listen and watch. There's mm -hmm. nothing like seeing it Being as well there. as hearing it. Absolutely. And live as yeah, opposed live to, in the as club, opposed to you know, on your computer. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that you know that's mm -hmm. New York when New York still had a lot of clubs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, uh, when I when I auditioned, getting back to this audition to music and art because it was really quite something. My friend. 
trumpet player we went to intermediate school together, William Harrison, he was getting he was going to go into the jazz band. And he said, you know, I heard that the drummer in the jazz band, because Music and I had a jazz band as well, we right. had, there were like five orchestras and five bands wow. in that school. Each grade had a band and an orchestra. Wow. And uh, so he heard, rumor had it, that the drummer who was playing in the jazz band was relocating, and there might be a slot open. Uh, it, it ended up being filled by the great Kenny Washington, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But at any rate, they said, well, why don't you come down and, and, and check out the band? It was in the summer. And um, so I said, sure. So I went down to school with him. And the conductor of the jazz band was this guy. He, I'd never seen a guy ever look like this before, okay? <laughs> he was this cool dude. He had uh, kind of round tinted shades. He had these kind of blue bell bottoms, kind of high water with bold white stripes and these brown Chelsea boots and a white shirt. I'd never seen a teacher like this before. I was like incredible. I said, who is this freaking guy? This is unbelievable. And he was cool. He's conducting the band. I said, wow, this is, I haven't, you know, I haven't even started the school yet, but this is the school. This is incredible. Ready, I mean, right? This is a school. <laughs> And it was right in the middle of Harlem. It was 135th Street and Convent Avenue. This is before it was moved into Lincoln Center. Oh, yeah. Where is it it now, was yeah. right in the middle yeah. of City College. Right. So we, it was like we were in college because the, college, the curriculum of the school was very high. Mm. And we would have people from the college actually visit our high school. Mm. That's how incredible. So it was like being on the college campus. Amazing. All right. So we had this. So um, my dad who worked in the municipal building, in the architectural section, uh, um, where he worked for the city. He said, okay, Steve, uh, go to your grandmother's house. She lived in Harlem on 150th Street. He said, go to your grandmother's house after school, after this audition, and I'll meet you there. There's a Jazzmobile performance that, uh, later that night, and we'll go. It was right around the block from her place on 158th Street and St. Nicholas Avenue. On 157th, there was gonna be a, a Jazzmobile performance. And what Jazzmobile would do is they would uh, block off a street, right. have a flat bed, yep. and have a band there, and yeah. it was free. Yeah. And it was just right. an incredible, what a great program. it was always an amazing yeah, thing. What a great program, yeah. So that night it was Dizzy Gillespie's big band. <laughs> so, okay, so I go to my grandmother's house and spend time you know, with her, she's amazing. My dad comes, we go to uh, Dizzy, uh, to see Dizzy. I look up at the bandstand and I go, Dad! I look in the trumpet section, that's my teacher! That's my teacher, I just met him today, that's the teacher. That it was Lee Morgan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mickey Roker was playing drums. Mickey's on drums, yeah, he was great, great, great player. I think Bob Cranshaw was playing bass. Wow. I think, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm, I think Milt Jackson was actually playing in a big band too. I, I'm not really sure, I could get a little, yeah. but it was Lee Morgan. Oh my God. And this was is... like basically three weeks before he was killed. Wow. Wow. So this is wow. this is a real New York story. Absolutely. You know, this is the only in New York that Absolutely. this happened. Absolutely. But it's kind of interesting because it seems like you surrounded yourself with people that were were great teachers. You you had opportunities that were because of where you lived at that time. Right. There were opportunities, but you you like maximize these opportunities. That was the thing, and I I learned that from my parents. Wow. You know, every night at the dinner table, we're, we're talking about politics, whatever. You know, he, he worked for the city, so there was always something going something on. Like was, and yeah. we were always, you know, very involved. That's mm -hmm. why my favorite uh, subjects in school were history, social studies, whatever. Yeah. That was the stuff that I was uh, really drawn to. Interesting. And that led to me being kind of into the history of music and who played what and yeah. how they played it and what they played it on and who recorded it and everything and that's what's so important to me and so when somebody comes up and they and they're playing hey you know like they just discovered something yeah yeah you know it's like Columbus discovering America I yeah. think it was here first I think somebody was actually yeah. living here 
<laughs> you know what I mean? I think there were people here. I don't know. I'm just saying. I think there were some people here. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I like to know where things came from, yeah. you know. So, you know, like the fact that Hubert Sumlin was Jimi Hendrix's favorite guitar player. Right, right. Do people know that? Right. I don't know, but I'm going to let people know Good that, for that you. was the thing. Good for you. You know, that's that kind yeah, of stuff, yeah. you know. And uh, so th that's the environment. Only, like I say, getting back to only in New York. In but New that's, York, yeah, yeah. It wasn't like I sought out to, to like, this is what my goal is to find. You know, it just was nurtured. Yeah. You know, and that's why I'm, you know, if I see a young musician, um, I never kind of turn away anyone or I, I'm always one I got so much help mm. as a kid yeah. that I, my job is to to return the favor I had so much support from people who didn't know me from Adam and um, you know and that's the kind of stuff you never forget well, absolutely but you, you seem to have you know aside from being having that hunger and that thirst right. to learn you had an entrepreneurial sense about you that was really very different. And it, it right. obviously from your parents and the guidance of you having a close-knit family like that, right. that you discuss things, that, that has got to be a part that has brought you to playing with the great musicians that you've played with, that, you know, producing and getting involved in that area. But that you've broadened your sense right. of who you are. Well, you can't have all your eggs in one basket. And my, 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 parent, my mother... You know, in particular, they, you know, she's very concerned about yeah. going out and trying to be a musician yeah, sure. and making a living. Yeah, yeah. And she, you know, I remember very distinctly her saying to me one day, you're going to need something to fall back on. And that's why I said, I'm not going to need anything to fall back on. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> now, when you say that to your mother, you better make it work. Absolutely, you know what I mean? man. <laughs> so you, that was the thing. It was like, okay, this is a commitment of you know, gargantuan proportions. Mm. So you have to be very smart about how you're going to go about it and know that this is, there's no turning back. Right. I, you can't change horses in the middle of the stream. You can't turn back. You have, if you're going in, you're going in. So, and, and you know, of course, there, there, you know, a lot of horror stories of great musicians not doing well, you know, whatever, the you yeah. know, being overlooked, whatever, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, whatever, yeah, you know, there's yeah. so many. So you have to keep that in mind and, and develop every aspect of your musicianship because if you're going to be a professional, it takes more than just being a good player. Right, right. You can be a great player or really good or very talented or have a lot of facility but the the thing is, to me, the the job of a musician is to be an ambassador of goodwill. Mm. Music is an international language. Yeah. I can go to any part of the world yeah. and play with anyone yeah. because I want to communicate and I and I want to bring joy to the situation. Yeah. And so that is that is the beacon. Uh, for me and the concert, that's what I live by. So uh, when that is first and foremost, then that kind of guides you to Absolutely. who you Absolutely. who you make relationships with, right. who how you're looked upon. Right. Uh, you can be really good, but if you have the wrong attitude and people don't want to be around you, what good is it going to do? You can be Absolutely. as great, you know, I mean, you can be really good and it doesn't matter. Nobody's going to hire you. Nobody's going to work with you. But that's always been your mantra. You've always had that that positive perseverance. Talk about perseverance. Yeah. You, you just keep going and, and, and you, you make it work. You have to. And, that's interesting. And, and, and to be a producer, you have to make it work. Right. Um, you have to have a lot of other skills b besides being a musician. Yeah. And that's just one yeah, of yeah. the many ingredients that makes up a, a, a producer. But you have great people skills, which is almost kind of like political skills. You have really, you, you know the, how to read people. And that, that's, you know, whether well, that's... I, a, I got that from my parents. Well, that, and that's, yeah. that's very deep because yeah. that, that's, a, that's, as a producer, you've got several personalities that you're balancing. Absolutely. And you're trying to pull out the best of what they have. As an artist, when you go into play and you're going into a session, you've got to find out, you know, 
what exactly am I going to play to balance the part that makes it best for the bigger picture? Right. That's that's a real, it's a real, that's a whole other ability there. <laughs> and it, and it's a thing that you're always refining. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's never just a thing. It's a moving target, and it's something that you have to keep refining. And you, you never really. First of all, you never have it made and you never get it down. Right, right, right. right, you're, right. you're always trying to get better. Right. And, you know, sometimes in this business, you're only as good as the last thing you did. Right. So you never walk around thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm I did it. This, I got I it. Did. Yeah, I'm yeah, good. Yeah, no. yeah. That's the kiss of death. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, and it's also, I know I want to get better. I, I, there are a lot of things I want to do better. Hmm. You know, there's just a lot of stuff that I can improve upon, and I know that. And even if somebody doesn't think that there's that, oh, well, don't you, you know, aren't you satisfied with that? Absolutely not. Yeah. You know, I know what I can get better at. So you've set no comfort zone for yourself. There is absolutely you're, no comfort You're zone. on the edge all the time. That's a, that's, yeah. a, that's a powerful personality commitment. Right. That you've made, that not a lot of people make that make that right. commitment or whatever. That's very very huge. Who would you say that you've worked with, you know, as an artist specifically, mm -hmm. that had those qualities that maybe you learned from? Was there anybody that you, that you you felt, boy, that's a this, this person's got it together. They they, they really well, uh, people like Tommy Lapuma, yeah, Al Schmidt. Hmm. The great Frank Foster and Joe Newman. You know, yeah. when I was playing with yeah. Joe Newman, you know, these guys, they played the, the Basie Big Band. Absolutely. They were the, the thing. That was, they, that when, was the When core. Joe Newman gave me, well, I was playing in, a, in this big band, in the Jazz Interactions Big Band. I'm playing. And, you know, my favorite drummer, I learned later, <clears throat> I didn't know it then, but my favorite big band drummer is Sonny Payne. Oh, of course, God. he played with Sonny God. Payne. Deep with now, Sonny, you know, right? I mean, Sonny Payne is like, <laughs> oh, my God. So Joe Newman gives me the, the chart. There's no drum chart. He gives me the first trumpet part. He says, that's what the drummers read. Yeah. It has all the hits. The first trumpet has all the hits of the thing. <laughs> you read the first trumpet part. So that's that kind that's of great. stuff, you know. Um, uh, Freddie Waits was a very influential wow. mentor. When I first visited his home in the village, he had a um, a place uh, that his son Nashit hmm. still lives in, who's a great drummer as well. Interesting. And uh, it was in West Beth. That the uh, it's a a, a, a complex uh, for artists. Hmm. And, it, and he had a duplex, you know, all our apartments are duplex and everything. I'm like, it's in the village. This is it, man. Mm. I'm in the West Village. This great apartment. And all artists. This is the life. This is it. This is what I want. <laughs> so I was with this guy, like, all the time. And yeah. he was grooming me. And, and um, you know, it, it was just great. And, How uh, amazing. You know, it's just that kind of thing. Working with Sonny Rollins, having him mentor me for, for a long time. I played with him since I was a, basically a teenager. Yeah. Um, off and on for all of that time. But Sonny Rollins is not a nostalgic person. Yeah. He is always going forward. Absolutely. And here's a guy who not only, well, it's easy to say he's the greatest living player because that yeah. goes without saying, yeah, but... Yeah. He was legendary from like the 50s. Yeah, yeah. And when he decided that he was going to drop out and led to that sabbatical in which he practiced nonstop, right. which became a very famous part of his career. Right, right. When he left the scene. Yeah. You know, that was because he said, look, man, all these cats are coming up cold train and. And, and and all these cats and, and I got to get my act together. Yeah. So he was great. Everybody, now if he had rested on his laurels, he he was like, well, right. what do I need to practice? Right, I'm right. Sonny Rollins. Right, right. He was like, he heard train and all these. He was. He I said, him. man, <laughs> I got to. I'm dropping out. Yeah. And he started, you know, he, you know, was the Manhattan Bridge or Brooklyn Bridge, whatever, he practicing every by night. The bridge. Absolutely. Shedding, yeah, shedding. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I played with Sonny off and on. For years and years, and the last time I, my last go round with Sonny, I hadn't played with him 
for a while. And I thought there was something missing musically from my life. Mm. I found I wasn't playing any jazz. I realized how important that music was to me. Wow. You know, I'm very successful in all these other genres. Now, of course, let me just digress in saying that I don't play music in genres. The genres are uh, were created uh, by marketers who were yeah. selling a product. Absolutely, and the critics all came in to try to label this. Right, yeah, and yeah, yeah. I don't look at yeah. music that way at all. Yeah, wow. Okay, at all. Hmm. But it just so happens that I have been playing a lot of music that did not include this other part of my life. Hmm. This part, this all the same. And so some of the artists weren't, you know, playing straight ahead, you know, hmm. kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. <clears throat> and there was nobody I really wanted to play with. And then Sonny called. And he said, oh, Steve, uh, you know, I'm going to tour. Are you available? And he was always busting my chops about, you know, <laughs> being like a famous rock guy and stuff. And um, I said, well, let me call you back. Let me, let me see if I'm available. And not just uh, available. I was nervous. Yeah. Could I cut it? Hmm. I didn't know if I could cut playing with him. I didn't know if I could, I could do it. And my wife, Megan, who's a great songwriter, singer, and we have a band called The Verbs. Yes. And we, we, you know, she's this tremendous... And, and every aspect of life, and she saw me. She saw me after the call, and she and she was like, "What do you mean you don't know if you can do it? <laughs> what do you What are you talking about? You better call him back and say you're going to do it." <laughs> and I said, "Well, I don't know if I can cut it." She said, "You're going to call him back and yeah. say you're going to do it." Yeah. And then, so I called him back. I said, "I'm available," and then I went back into the woodshed. Nice, nice. And so, for instance, there is uh, the first jazz album. Well, there are two things. My dad, who, like I told you about listening to music all the time, he, he said to me, uh, like I was eight years old, he said, okay, if you learn how to play Art Blakey's Blues March, you'll be able to play anything. Oh, that's great advice. Isn't that amazing? That's Rated is that it. unbelievable? That really is very deep. So, yeah, really deep, you know? <laughs> and so he had, you know, of course he had the album, and he played the thing, and I learned Blues March. <laughs> that was like the first thing I ever learned on the drums was Art Blakey's Blues March. <laughs> and so, uh, so I had that. that. That was in my DNA. That was always there. But the first album that I really, the first jazz album that I really, really got into was Miles Davis, Seven Steps to Heaven. Mm. You know, and I used to just listen to that all the time. And I, I would practice that. Now, my yardstick to, to getting my goal, you know, you set goals for yourself. Right. So my goal was Tony Williams played on that record, mm. and he was only 17 years Absolutely. old when he played that. Brilliant. Which yeah. is like the most incredible drumming you'll ever hear. Right, right. And he was only 17. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Nobody could believe it. Yeah, Nobody yeah. still can believe yeah, it that absolutely. he was just 17 years old. So my goal was to get somewhere by the time I was 17. Hmm. That, was, that was what I was shooting for. Tony did that at 17. Okay, I got to get somewhere in that area. <laughs> I might not make it at 17, but I, that's... That's the goal. What a huge push, man. That's oh, really my God. It's serious. It's insane, really, just... but that was the thing. Oh, wow. So now cutting back to this thing, I, I start listening. I went, okay, well, what are my influences? I, when, I, when, I, when I'm going to play with Sonny, I have to go out. I have to kick some butt. I can't just be playing. I, I got to lay. I got to throw down. I got to yeah, freaking, yeah. man, there are bad cats out there. Yeah, there are yeah, cats yeah. all over the place. Yeah. You got Jeff Tane Watts. You got Willie Jones. You know, I'm not, I'm not even talking about the, my, my heroes like Jack DeJanette and oh, everything. Jack, I mean, yeah, come yeah, on. Yeah. So I go in and I just start <laughs> shit because I want to get a sound. I don't want to just, I don't like a lot of this playing where there's this playing for the sake of playing. The right. reason why Sonny Rollins called me because he liked my groove. Hmm. And this is Sonny Rollins. Yeah. And he wants me because he likes my pocket, my groove. So I'm like, okay, great. So that's 
that is what he wants. Mm. So I, I have to now take that and enhance, but I don't have to play any superfluous kind of right. extracurricular crap to, right. you know, because that's not the way I want to play. That's not my thing. And that's not what he wants. So you got to keep it. You got to keep the groove. I got to keep my groove. You got to have some edge. Right. And you got to offer uniqueness. Exactly. And that's what you're going into this with. Exactly. That's really right. intense. So I start <laughs> listening. Now, so I go back and I, and I listen to, to Seven Steps to Heaven again, the whole album, and I'm hearing stuff I never heard. You know, because when, when, when you have a great recording, it always lives. It, uh, it, yeah. it unfolds. Yeah, year after year. For the, it, for it, yeah. the life of its yeah. existence. Yeah. 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 So now I'm hearing stuff, and now I'm older, I'm hearing stuff that I didn't hear before heard, when yeah. I was yeah. Yeah. 10, 12, whatever. Now yeah. I'm hearing stuff, like, whoa, wait a minute. And then you know, I'm hearing stuff about, that's phenomenal, and then I'm hearing stuff about, that's not actually as good as I thought it was when I heard, you know, right. all of that. Right, right. And I'm hearing stuff, oh, that's what that is now. Now I understand. Right. So now, I'm, so I do that. Then I, then I start listening. Then I, I, I dig into Sonny's kind of thing and uh, in his history. Right. And the great drummers he's played with, from yeah. Shelly Mann Absolutely. To, to Max Roach. Yeah to you know ever and the main cat that he played with besides Elvin, Philly oh, Joe, Philly Joe was, Jones. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah, yeah. if you start yeah. at a certain point, so my age group, we went from Tony out. But there right. was all this stuff that happened prior Beforehand, to Beforehand, absolutely man. And and yeah. so Philly Joe Jones actually set up the vocabulary hmm. To what Tony? Then he, Tony took it and Absolute, did some Yeah, yeah. Now, when I was a kid, I would stop in Frank Eppolito's drum shop. I was always in there, and yeah. Frank loved me and 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 let me hang out. And I would go in there, and I'm I, I met Papa Joe Jones. He I took a couple of lessons with Papa Joe Jones from Frank. Absolutely, yeah. from going up to the store. You're going yeah, up yeah, there, yeah, Papa yeah, Joe having yeah. his Heineken. Yeah, with with Frank. You know, so you meet all these legends. I met Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich. Up there, he said, you know, I was playing Saturday Night Live at the time. He was like, uh, and he liked me. You know, but everybody, when you meet Buddy, you didn't know what you were going to get. Big time, yeah. And yeah, Buddy yeah. actually liked the way I played. And I was <laughs> like, whoa! <laughs> like, unbelievable. This is incredible, you know? It's like with uh, meeting Don Rickles uh, a year and a half ago. I was a musical director for the Don Rickles tribute on Spike Television. Put together a nice band. And the music was great that night, and I met Don afterwards, and he liked what I did. And it was like, whoa, Don Rickles, like, you know, because I mean, your whole childhood, you think Absol he's going to slay you. Absolutely. His <laughs> manager is Tony Opetisano. Right. Who was there and told me about that. Oh, okay. That he had spoken to you. Yeah. And I said, how great was that? Yeah, it was and unbelievable. I saw the special. And you nailed it. It was Thank great. You. All the guys that were there, that was a yeah. phenomenal event. Yeah. yeah, it was really something. Yeah. And, you know, so it was that kind of thing. Don Rickles. Yeah. <laughs> Buddy Rich, the same kind of thing. <laughs> Look out. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know. So anyway, so getting back to the Philly Joe thing. So now I'm discovering and then those records where that, that one record where it's just Sonny and Philly Joe. Right. And now I'm hearing all this music. So now I go, okay, now I have to now I'm 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 honing in on a concept of how I'm gonna play with Sonny. Yeah. Some of the Philly Joe thing. Then I listen and then I start listening to a lot of monk. Man. And I started listening to Ben Riley. Mm. Now Ben Riley, when I met Ben Riley at Jazz Interactions, he was one of the instructors. Oh, interesting! Wow. Yeah. Well, look at these guys. Kind of that, a these guys, guy. that, yeah, yeah, grumpy, He's but I mean, a little grumpy. But he played. Oh, but he was simple. Yeah, yeah. But he had a groove in a pocket. Yeah, yeah. But I never appreciated him because I thought he was like a grumpy guy. You know? <laughs> so I was like, yeah. Anyway, now I'm listening to him, and it's yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. I'm trying to take a little Ben Riley, a little Philly Joe. You know, a little max, but you know, and trying to make it yeah, yeah. part of my thing. thing. Yeah, and so that's how I went into mm. this last sunny thing. I went back into the woodshed and practiced and really tried to get better and and grow in 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 playing this music. You know, well, so you, I, I, this is great. This and is great. and uh, and that's what you got to do. Right. You never, you're never all the way there. 
You can, but, you always can get but better. But you push yourself that way. It's not like someone else is pushing you, other than, have, your, other you than, have than, to push other than your wife making throwing you into the gig itself. Right, right. But I mean, the fact is, that's, that's something which the younger generation really has to understand, that you are self-propelling your ability and your unused potential to discover and see, and the fact that you're pulling from from Philly and you're pulling from Shelly Man and you're pulling from right. this is that, that, that's right. amazing to pull it in. Yeah, yeah, and and, and that you have to know yourself. You, you have to realize. You have to be honest with yourself. Mm. What are your um, shortcomings? Right. What can you improve upon? Right. You know, I right. can improve upon. I, I can improve upon everything, really. Yeah. Quite frankly, you know, <laughs> where do I begin? <laughs> but you know, you take this one step at a time. So this is your next job. So boom. Uh, so that's that's what I had to work on, and it was really encouraging. And so much, uh, it was a challenge that I love. You know, the other thing is. When you have a lot of friends who are great musicians, right. you are learning from all of these friends that are your closest friends. Like right. I have, like my older brother, like Danny Korchmar, one mm -hmm. of the greatest guitar players, songwriters ever. You yeah. know, and yeah. he's a partner and he's a friend. And I learned about songwriting from him. I've mm -hmm. learned some, about some stuff from production from I got like a guy, Clayton Cameron, you know, one of the best drummers in the world. Absolutely. The best in the world at using brushes. Brushes is incredible. So I say to him, now I'm and, playing and with Big Sonny. Ben said that too, yeah, who was no, another man. And so, I, yeah. so I, I, I'm seeing, I, there's a lot of brush work when I'm playing with Sonny because he likes ballads. Yeah. So I said, man, my brush stuff isn't really, like, so I said, clean, man, I need some lessons. Come here. You know, I don't have, you know, but I, I know the best guy. Yeah. I'd be an idiot not to not freaking to use, ask not him to, use that to help me. Great. That's a quality, but you always seem to surround yourself and you always seem to find and pull in. That goes back to your, some of your political skills, so to right. speak. Sure. You, you know how to pull people in right. for what you need, but you do this with, with you know, playing, you do it with producing, you, you, you really, that's a... When I do the like the Emmys, I, uh, you know, my friend Paul Jamison who does my tech work when I'm out here, Yeah. you know, we nicknamed the Emmy Orchestra that I have, uh, uh, Steve, uh, Steve J and the MDs, because all I do is I just hire yeah. all the best people, and they're all producers and musical directors right. in their own right. Right, right. Because I don't have a problem with that. I, uh, you know, some people <clears throat> find it hard to want to hire the best people because they're a little nervous about right if they're going to lose their jobs. Lose, lose their gig. <laughs> Absolutely, totally, totally, totally. I don't care about yeah, that. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? This is like, you, you want to be the best. You want to come off as the best. You want to have the best. The, the, the idea is to come out with the best product. Right, right, right. The best thing. Right. For the end result to be amazing. Right. So you hire the best people, period. Right. Right. And if and if it means that uh, whatever it means, that's yeah. that's all I'm going Absolutely, for. Yeah, whatever yeah. the circum uh, the consequences are afterwards, that's right. another thing. Right. If somebody who hired you thinks that they can get that without you, which has happened, right? And then right. they find out otherwise, right? Because there are so many ingredients that Absolutely. go down. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, know, you know, some people. I've been a, a, a victim of, so to speak, not really victim, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, um, you know, somebody will hire you. To think that they can like glean some stuff of how you do something and then right. try to do the rest of it without you. Right, right. And right. it's never, it's not that. Right. Because right. it's not just that. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Right, but, right. you know, right. You know, you live and learn. The thing I, I remember when I would have a, a sub on, on Letterman, <clears throat> and I would always hire somebody who was really great. A lot of times it was like Charlie Drayton or something right. like that. Right, right. And people would say, aren't you a little nervous about having this guy so good be your sub, you know? And I said, no, because first of all, I, want, I don't want people to be upset that the band isn't sounding good because you sent in like somebody subpar. That's right. number one. Number two, I realized that I'm, there's only one me. Yeah. So, uh, like, I grew up, uh, when I started doing Saturday Night Live, I mean, my, you know, I, my close friends, John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, yeah. I know about comedy. Right. I know the, the timing involved and right. things like that. And, and, you know, so I know that. Right. I was the person right. that did that, not right. the, my sub. So right. I know how to interact with Dave. Right. 
So I know that there's going to be only that, and and so it's not going to be the same. Yeah, it's going to be great when we come to playing the music, going into the commercials. Right, right, right. Stuff, and that's what that's my main thing. That's what I want. But as far as interacting with Dave or any how we interpret the comedy or whatever, well, that's just me. Right. You, you know. That's, so that's a special ingredient. That I mean, you know, there's a certain confidence there's a certain knowing your craft real well there's a lot right. of variables that go into that right that you know a lot of the young generation doesn't really understand that you know you really have to so have so many act ingredients you got to have that act together yeah and there's so many ingredients uh and uh i like doing <clears throat> musical directorial ships i love producing i love just playing i love writing i love playing guitar I stopped playing drums for a while when I started just writing. Yeah. And then I appreciated the drums more when I started playing again. Right. You know, that kind of thing. Sometimes right. you have to step back. Step back. I have to take one you know, step back to take um, two shoes. And I've been very fortunate yeah. to work with people like, obviously, Keith Richards. Yeah. My experience working with the Stones has been incredible. Neil Young, Bob Dylan, you know, working with Don Henley was amazing. Yeah. Cutting with Chrissy Hine. All this stuff with John Mayer and and having to work with the best, you know, I two of my best friends in the world are Willie Weeks and Pino Palladino. Like, oh, you know what I mean? <laughs> and how spoiled can you be? <laughs> Will Lee is one of my closest friends. Yeah. You know, Neil Jason. You know, all these great musicians, mm. and they all have special qualities that are unique unto themselves whether well, it's Larry Taylor playing the upright yeah. like Willie Dixon you know yeah, what I mean yeah, you know who's incredible absolutely, you know absolutely. you know or Kim Wilson who a lot of people think of him as a singer and a harp player because he can play like little Walter but he can also play blues guitar I learned yeah. a lot of blues guitar stuff between Kim Wilson and Keith Richards you know you know that kind of thing so I've been very fortunate to, with the people you use them as resources. It's almost Absolutely. like you're, you're pulling from, you're learning from them. You're always in university mode at all Absolutely. times. Absolutely. I, when I was working with Hubert Sumlin, I said, please give me a guitar lesson. <laughs> I worked with Ellie Willis, Eddie Willis, great Motown. You know, give me a lesson. <laughs> I've been around the best people. How can I not ask for a lesson? Jocko Pistorius gave me a bass lesson that I'll never forget. <laughs> and, and um, you know, and... And he gave me some advice. He said, you know, Steve, write every day. It doesn't have to be good. Hmm. Every song you write is not going to be great. But try to write. When I was starting to write music, yeah. it was just start writing something every day. Yeah. And that's what he did. You yeah. know, and uh, well, that was great advice. Because you can't just sit around and try to write one song and beat it over the head or right, think right, that, right. you're not good or get lazy. If you want, yeah. It's a discipline. Yeah, yeah. You're you want to be a songwriter. It. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've worked with Burt Backrack, who's one of the greatest songwriters, obviously, yeah. ever of all time. Yeah. And and um, it was a, a thrill mm. to work with such genius. Boy, how you know? powerful, how powerful. You know, with, with the young generation and all these names, as they research these names to understand more about it. Right. In closing, what would you say to generations of young, inspired, and aspiring musicians? What would you say to them? the overall understanding of the music industry. Here's the thing about the music industry. You don't need the music industry to make music. But the music industry needs you to make music or else there's no industry. Interesting. So, Perfect. when people get all twisted, they're trying to get on a chart, <clears throat> they're trying to, somebody's telling them, oh, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Wait a minute, hold on. If you, if push comes to shove, if you, go on the street, if you know how to play, you can go on the street and take a hat, put it down, and, <laughs> and, and you can make a living. Right. I mean, if that's... Right. Absolutely. But the music industry, without any music, you can't wait where, where how they're going to make not, revenue. They're not there's no survive. music. Right. Okay? Well said. Well, well said. The other thing is, it's better to be good than to try to be famous. Try to get good. Try to be good at what you're doing. Right. Don't try to, try to be famous. Right. That's what all these shows have done. The shows have, from American Idol to The Voice, to all of these yeah. shows, what they've done is they've undermined the creative process in America in particular. Yeah. 
I think, you know, some of these shows were actually created outside of America. Right, right. But because we're in such a reality show... Mentality, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cluster blank yeah, right yeah, now, yeah. where we have people like, you know, you know that's why you're going to have Donald Trump right. and all this right stuff on, going right on. on. Right on. We've lost our way. Mm. All right? So... People want to be famous. Right. But if you're really good, the chances are you will end up being famous at some point. Right. And then you'll have something to show for it. Right. It won't be, you won't be a reality show star or whatever or, or have something hot for like six months to a year and then right. never be heard from right. again. You'll have a career. You will have a it, career yeah, with yeah. longevity, yeah, yeah. with backbone, with some root. Right. And it will bring you joy in your life. You will, you will, and you'll feel good about yourself you, because you're actually good at something. Right. Boy, that's very, very powerful. You know, I, you know and, 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 and that's the thing. That, that's it. You, you have a, a discipline that you have consistently maintained incredible high standard of playing. You continue to do that. You can see it within just your philosophy of how you treat life and how you face the world that that really is what makes Steve Jordan Steve Jordan. That is so powerful. That's the best message. You have done great. I think this message that these kids, as they see this and they understand this, you've opened up eyes to many, many young musicians. You continue to do it. On behalf of the sessions, we thank you so much. Thank you very you've much, You've done Tom. great, Steve. Thank you so much. All right, man. God bless. <laughs> great. <laughs>